Hello once again from the Prim Reaper. I've actually been working on an entirely different script for the last little while, but I decided that I wanted to do this one first because it's a real treat. It's a little web page that was linked in one of my course lessons called the Internalized Sexism Inventory. Now, I'm not quite sure exactly how to categorize this video because it's a combination of the hijacking of higher education and a misuse of the word sexism. Since I've been neglecting the latter series, I think that's exactly what I'm going to call this one, although I did find the source material in my class. That can essentially be a secondary concern today. After all, we already knew and have seen many examples of this exact sort of faulty logic in this course, so this should really come as no surprise at this point. Let's preface this video, as I usually do in these cases, with the definition of sexism. Now, interestingly, for this one, there's three. One, attitudes or behavior based on traditional stereotypes of gender roles. Two, discrimination or devaluation based on a person's sex or gender, as in restricted job opportunities, especially such discrimination directed against women. Three, ingrained and institutional prejudice against or hatred of women, misogyny. Notice anything different about those second two definitions? Already we're turning what should be a gender-neutral word into something that is directed exclusively at women. Now, I'll even give you that in a lot of the world, women do face a lot of mistreatment. However, let me further clarify by saying that usually in areas where this is the case, often the men don't have it so fantastic either. Certainly not so much better than women that we shouldn't also acknowledge that they have their problems as well. In the West, however, it's absolutely laughable to think that women face more sexism than men, despite what many people will have you believe. And I guess that's what the problem is here, the absurdly minuscule things that people will mistake for sexism, or shall I say, internalized sexism. Now, internalized sexism is the idea that, again, usually women, have internalized sexist messages from our terrible patriarchal world about ourselves or other women as a whole. Now, as always, this is rarely ever a particularly accurate view, and it tends to oversimplify things to a massive degree and make negative assumptions of otherwise harmless thoughts and behaviors, and never, ever have I seen a more perfect example of exactly what I'm talking about than in this internalized sexism inventory I was talking about earlier. For the fun and entertainment, we're going to go through the list together and criticize each and every one. I'll probably have to break this up in the hopes of getting anything out in any reasonable amount of time, but for now, go on ahead and grab your popcorn. Number one, do I give more credibility to men's respect, approval, praise, or criticism than women's? Number two, when selecting providers of critical services for myself or a loved one, e.g. surgeon, legal counsel, etc., do I feel more confident of men's or women's skills? I read these first two together because already we're starting off on a faulty premise. Let me take a very brief tangent and talk a little about how people like the ones who wrote this inventory tend to think of men and women as nebulous groups rather than as individuals who happen to be men or women. This is an oversimplification of the way that people interact with each other in real life. People will lend credibility to individuals based on their credentials and based on the situation. There are some situations where people might prefer a woman's touch or might prefer speaking to a man. These preferences will differ from individual to individual and will often differ situationally as well. For example, a given woman might select a female gynecologist but might prefer talking to men for other matters. An individual might primarily work for male bosses and therefore would be likely to seek to earn their approval generally more than women. Someone might prefer working with men or women based on their previous experiences with men or women. Furthermore, people might give credibility to one man's respect or approval more than a different man's respect or approval. Or they may feel the same about different women. For example, if someone works for two female bosses, one of whom is cold and dismissive and the other one is warm and friendly, they will be more likely to value the praise of the pleasant boss over the unpleasant one. This will likely be the case regardless of the sex of the individual. 
My point here is that assuming that someone will always give more credibility to men or to prefer male service providers is missing a huge chunk of the way that people interact with others. All this in the service of trying to behave like a given woman who has the audacity to prefer interacting with men is somehow sexist towards other women. Somehow, I'm sure, if a different woman preferred interacting with, receiving services from, or earning respect and approval from exclusively other women, this would not be an indication of any sexism against men, though, right? Funny how that works. Number three. As I board an airplane, or am rolled into an ER, or call for police intervention in a violent situation, if I discover the pilot, or the ER doc, or the responding officer is a woman, what is my first feeling? Do I in any way question her complete competence for my safety? These are three very different examples of jobs. While the first two likely do not require any differences in physical strength, except perhaps in the case of being able to lift heavy patients, but often the attending physicians are not the people responsible for those sorts of tasks. The third example almost certainly does. If a hypothetical woman is being abused by her six-foot violent spouse and a five-foot-four female officer shows up on the scene, do you think that she'll be able to defuse the situation as easily as a male officer of comparable size to the individual being violent? What about a female firefighter who can lift 50% less weight and who has a more difficult time breaking down doors in a burning building? Now, it's different if particularly strong women are able to compete with the men in these fields and have comparable results, but being biologically honest here, a lot of the time this isn't the case, and a lot of the time women are given reduced standards to be able to get into certain fields. And where I need someone to do a life-or-death job that requires considerable strength, I'm sorry, but I know which category of individual is going to be more likely to stack up. That's not sexism, that's reality. Number four. When I dress, how much do I seek men's approval for what I'm wearing? If my audience is largely men, and I decide to dress as the Prim Reaper for the funnies, does this count as seeking men's approval for what I'm wearing? First of all, how is it an example of internalized sexism to dress to gain men's approval? If a given woman decides that she wants to go out with the intention of seeking men's approval or interest, then is that not her choice? Is she not a mature adult in control of her decisions? How is it anyone else's business what that woman wants to dress like? What if seeking men's approval is one of the ways that she uses to bolster her self-confidence? Would it be internally sexist if she was a lesbian and decided that she wanted to go out with the intention of gaining women's interest as well? Do you see how making assumptions about women's choices as being an indicator of internalized sexism is incredibly patronizing and, dare I say it, sexist in itself? If a man decided that he wanted to dress to impress a woman, I bet that you wouldn't discount his choices as being an indicator of internalized self-disrespect, now would you? Number five. Do I trust women? How often do I mistrust another woman's intentions? Neither women nor men are inherently trustworthy or untrustworthy. It does not make sense to make blanket statements about qualities like this of a large group because, as much as people like those who wrote this list would like to think, one sex does not inherently make someone a good person. If I trust an entire group based on an unrelated quality, it makes me naive. If I mistrust an entire group based on an unrelated quality, it makes me unreasonably suspicious. Sure, if someone mistrusts women just because they are women, then sure, that would be sexist. But the same would be true of men. And I see far more people in the public sphere making broad blanket statements about men these days, and somehow that's considered A-OK, -okay, so there you have it. Number six. When I need information about something technical, mechanical, mathematical, car repair, plumbing, computer, or science-related, etc., do I assume I can't figure it out? Do I usually first ask or hire a man? Do I assume that I can't operate on my own leg if I fall and break it? No, you giant moron, I'm not making assumptions. I'm aware of what I can and cannot do. If I were able to do car repair or plumbing, I would probably be doing those things for employment because they're often quite lucrative positions. I usually first ask someone who is trained in these matters so that I don't risk breaking something and making the problem worse. I don't care if the person who is trained is a man or a woman. 
Number seven, do I ever censor my own opinion and or passion when in conversation, discussion, or argument with men? No. First of all, I try never to censor my opinion because A, I don't think that my opinions are, or ought to be, all that controversial, and I'm not afraid of defending my views if someone takes issue with them. And B, I have never had the experience they're implying here, where men are dismissive of me because I am a woman. I have no doubt that other people have experienced this, but I find far more often that men become more eager when I express my interest in something they like, not less. I also wonder how many examples of men supposedly doing this to women are just being misinterpreted as being patronizing. Either way, if I ever do self-censor, I do it far more often when talking to other women, because in my own personal experience, women are usually more judgmental of my opinions than men are. Go figure. Number 8. Do I ever get embarrassed by other women? Yes, absolutely. Women aren't ethereal beings incapable of making an ass out of themselves. I feel like it would be far more sexist to assume that they were than to admit that, yes, amazingly, some women in my life have done stupid things that I've felt vicariously embarrassed by. Number 9. Do I ever try to silence other women? This is such a weirdly phrased question. I'm not even 100% sure what this means. I'm sure I can guess what they think it means. For example, I'm sure my video talking about Me Too being off the mark would be considered an example of silencing other women. However, in the real world, where silencing people means actively working to remove their ability to speak freely, of course I do not do this. Regardless, as I just said, women are capable of doing dumb things just the same as anyone else, and I will feel perfectly free to call them out when they do. Challenging someone is not silencing them. But hey, if you want an example of people silencing other women, why don't you check out how Christina Hoff Summer's most recent lecture went. Number 10. Do I compete with other women for the attention or approval of men? I'm married, so generally speaking, I don't find that I compete with other women much for that sort of thing anymore, but there are several different things that I can say here. How is it internalized sexism if I compete with another woman for the attention of a guy? Is this some sort of hose before bros thing? Is it a problem if two women like the same guy and then one woman successfully gets a date with him? Why would this be an example of internalized sexism rather than, I don't know, simply an example of how relationships work? If one woman backs off and leaves the guy to the other woman, is the woman who successfully gets his attention then guilty of internalized sexism? Or is she simply the lucky winner of a date with that guy? Should both women back off in order to be considered not guilty of internalized sexism? This is all very confusing. Number 11. Have I put down another woman to other women or men? Another example of a gendered issue that doesn't need to be gendered. Is it sexist to put down another woman but not another man? Why is it sexist just to put someone else down? What if you put someone down because they did something shameful that is deserving of criticism? Sure, it might be considered gossipy in that case, but is it sexist? I imagine it would only be sexist if you were putting them down for a sexist reason, would it not? Number 12. Do I diet often? Uh, excuse you? <laughs> I guess these guys consider a slim figure to be internalized sexism now. My question is, at what weight does a woman stop being internally sexist? 150 pounds? 200 pounds? What if I work hard to keep a normal BMI range, but rather than dieting, I just keep a reasonably consistent healthy lifestyle? Is that internally sexist? Is it less sexist to engage in occasional indulgences like chips or chocolate? Are certain bad diets more internally sexist than others? Is a salad less sexist if I use ranch dressing as opposed to light Italian? <laughs> Yes, these are silly and patronizing questions, but this is ridiculous. 
My diet, or my choice to go on diets as little or as often as I like, is 100% entirely unrelated to sexism in any way whatsoever. My mere existence as a thin woman is not fat shaming, my choice to cook healthy meals for myself is not misogyny, my regular workout is not patriarchal oppression. If anyone else has a problem with my size or my eating habits, conveniently enough, that problem rests entirely within them, not me. I can point to the demonstrable health benefits that go along with eating vegetables or having a regular exercise regimen, and once again, it's entirely unrelated to sexism, internal or external. Number 13. Do I shave my body hair, pluck, dye, or otherwise remove hair from eyebrows, face, armpits, legs? Yes, I do. Do you have a problem with that? Which one of us is the sexist here again? I'm not the one telling women that they secretly hate themselves based on how they prefer their personal grooming. Thank you. Number 14. Do I wear clothes that restrict my freedom of movement? Number 15. Do I wear shoes with heels over one inch high? I figured it would be easiest to pair these two things together because they seem essentially related. I don't often wear heels or wear clothes that make moving difficult or more complicated. <laughs> but once again, if I made the choice to do these things, that would be entirely on me. I'm not wearing them because I feel like I have to. I'm not wearing them because I want to make somebody else look bad by comparison. When I make these choices, I make them because I like the way I look in these clothes. To imply otherwise, or to act like I'm capitulating to some patriarchal demand by making my own personal choices is, in my mind, more sexist than the implication that my wanting to look nice is somehow internalized sexism. I don't see how wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt is less sexist than wearing a pencil skirt and stilettos. Sorry. Number 16. How often do I feel I should put on makeup before I go out of the house? Do people put on makeup more than once before they leave the house? No, seriously, I'm actually asking that question. Sunny, are you serious? It was overcast this morning. Ugh, I changed this lip gloss twice already today. There is no way that this is going to look good in this level of sunlight. It's going to make my skin tone all off and it's going to be awful. Ugh, the problems of dealing with being a woman. I swear to God, this is just the worst day ever. What am I ever going to do? Ugh. I mean, for me, a little eyeshadow, mascara, eyeliner or lip gloss if I'm feeling fancy, and then I'm done for the day. I always thought that even for people who put on more, like cover up and fake eyelashes or whatever else, they still only did it once and called it a day. Are there people who put on makeup two to three times before they leave the house? Did they not do it right the first time? I, I don't understand. But even if I did understand, this is yet again another example of discounting women's choices. It assumes that the woman is putting on additional makeup because she's feeling insecure or because she's doing it to gain male attention or something. What if, and I know that this is one big if, but what if the woman psst, just likes wearing a lot of makeup? <sighs> I know, I know. This whole respecting women's personal choices is pretty wild stuff. Anyway, I think I'm going to have to cut this one off here and divide this list over two or three videos. After all, there are 40 questions, and it turns out that I've had a lot to say on all of them. I think, given the amount of work that I have to do with school over the next little while, it'll be a lot easier for me to actually be able to get videos out if I stop biting off more than I can chew and stick to reasonable length scripts. I started tacking this one out, and before I knew it, I was up to six pages. But hey, more content means more fun, right? I'll keep working on this list to get more content out when I can, so I hope to see you all in the next one. Hey guys, I just wanted to do one impromptu thing at the end of this video. Someone informed me that April is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Now, I had a really good friend recently go through exactly that kind of cancer. And he, he's doing well now, so like I'm glad to hear that, but 
he got himself to a doctor fast when he noticed something wrong. So I just want to kind of tell you guys, make sure you're doing those frequent checks. Make sure you're going to the doctor regularly and especially get to the doctor if you see anything wrong. So there's lots of things that we can do to kind of prevent undue deaths from this kind of cancer. Those things are great steps, but another good way of dealing with it is to kind of try and donate to the charities that are supporting this kind of cancer, donate to research, all that sort of stuff. So I just wanted to end this video with that very important message, and I hope to see you all in the next one.